Good morning, St. Andrew Baptist Church. We're so happy that you're here today, and for those of you gathering, us, gathering with us online, we're happy that you're here with us too. Uh, we're just uh, here to just celebrate the Lord today and celebrate his goodness. And so first off, we'd like to direct your attention over here uh, to Brother Mike. And it's our joy today to baptize. What a blessed privilege it is every time that we have someone who, having come to faith in Jesus Christ, wants to follow him in baptism and then be a part of our church family. This is Tammy Thompson. Tammy, have you invited the Lord Jesus to be your own Lord personally and Savior? I have. In obedience to Christ's command, because you have made a public profession of your faith in him, I baptize you, my sister, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Buried with our Lord in baptism. 
Praise to walk in newness of life. Amen. Well, if you would, please stand. We're so excited to worship the Lord this morning. Um, he's a faithful God, amen. And we're excited to worship him. So sing this song if you know it. We've done it before. Well, you don't answer all my questions, but you hear me when I speak. You don't keep my heart from breaking, but when it does, you weep with me. You're so close that I can feel you when I've lost the words to pray. Though my eyes have never seen you, I've seen enough to say that's true, all right? I know that you are good. I know that you
grace when the heart is under fire. Another way when the walls are closing in. When I look at the space between where I used to be and this red me, I know I will never be alone. It was another end.
should use Bright Jesus.
Amen. Good to see you this morning. Missed being with you last week, but Karen and I took some days off, went to visit with uh, both of my brothers. The three of us had not been together for about 10 years. Uh, they're both older than I am. I know you're thinking, can somebody still be living and be older than Brother Mike? But, <laughs> but they can. And uh, we had a, a great time together and uh, uh, got to worship the three of us together in a church where my nephew is pastor. It's a church he planted in Memphis, starting with two other families, uh, meeting in a living room together. And now God has grown it into a, a really wonderful church, and it was the first time we got to hear him preach. So it was a special blessing. But missed you and grateful for Brother Jeremy uh, preaching in my place last week. I'm grateful for Brother Jeremy, Brother Mark, Brother, Brother Rick, to have associate pastors whenever I'm away, whether it's on mission or, or whatever might take me away. And one of them is, is preaching for me. I never have to worry uh, about the pulpit. I know that these are faithful men who preach the word of God straight as God has given it to us. And I'm never concerned about that. And so it's a great blessing to me and really grateful to Brother Jeremy for this last week. I want us to pick up as we're moving through the Gospels. And the last time that I was with you, Jesus had encountered the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and probably he was along the north, uh, the northwestern coast of the Sea of Galilee where this encounter uh, took place, somewhere between Migdal and Capernaum. And then afterwards, uh, well, when he, when he talked to them, he rebuked these leaders of Israel. Because they were leaders. They were the religious leaders, the spiritual leaders of the, the people. And they were students of the Word of God. You know, it's not like they didn't know the Word. They studied the Word. But Jesus rebuked them because they did not understand the signs of the time in which they were living. They were living in the very days that Messiah came and made his appearance on the earth to do the work God had promised he would do. They didn't even know it. They, they, they were totally unaware, and Jesus rebuked them. And then when he was gone from them, he turned to his disciples, and he said, you need to beware of the leaven, the, the worldview, the philosophies, the practices of the Sadducees who don't believe the power of God and don't believe the word of God. And you need to beware of the worldview of the Pharisees who value their tradition more than they do the commandments of the, the Lord. And you need to be aware of the, the worldview and the seductive practices of Herod who just lives for, for pleasure and for self to do what he wants to do to get out of life in the world. He said, beware of those things. They are dangerous. And then Jesus headed north with his disciples, a little over 14 hour walk all uphill to a region that was called Caesarea Philippi. And when they arrived there, Jesus paused with the group and he asked them a very critical question. Now, this was a controversial question when Jesus asked it. But it's interesting because it's still controversial today. He would think with all this time and all we know about Jesus that this thing would be settled. But it's not as far as the world is concerned. The scripture says in Matthew 16, and when Jesus came into the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples saying, who do men say that I, the son of man, am? And so they said, well, some say John the Baptist and others Elijah, others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. He said to them, but who do you say? That I am. Who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, You are the Christ, 
the son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said to him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I also say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. And I will give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Then he commanded his disciples that they should tell no one that he was Jesus the Christ. Jesus began by asking, What are the people saying about my identity? Who do they say I am? And sadly, the answers of his disciples were way off the mark. And you wonder why. I mean, with all the miracles he was doing, with all the ways that he had clearly fulfilled Old Testament prophecy about the coming of Messiah, with the way that he had taught the the crowds and in his teaching gave explanation of who he really was and what he came to do and and the life that he offered in his name, you, you think, why didn't they get it? And the answer to that is the same reason people don't get it today. It's the same reason If you ask them who Jesus is, you still get all kinds of answers. Jesus explained the answer in John 5. He said, for if you believed Moses, you would believe me, for he wrote about me. But if you do not believe his writings, how will you believe my words? Folks, even today... People do not recognize who Jesus really is because either they do not know or they do not believe the scriptures. That's the problem. So Jesus asked even his disciples, who do you say that I am? Let's look at the confession. (laughs) Dear old Simon Peter, Often wrong, but never in doubt. That was Peter. But this time he gets it right. In fact, he he never got it more right than he did at this moment. He answered and said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Now, Christ comes from the Greek word for Messiah. Messiah comes from the Hebrew word for or Messiah. They mean exactly the same, the anointed one. He said, you're the anointed one. You're the promised Messiah that God's been telling us through the prophets is coming. Son of the living God is an acknowledgement of Jesus' deity, that he was more than a preacher, more than a prophet. He was God in the flesh. And this was revealed to Simon by the Father. Jesus said, you're blessed, Simon Barjona, Simon, the son of John. For flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. This mirrors a truth that's very important for us to remember. Folks, this is a truth that, that we just ought to keep lodged in the back of our mind as a constant filter through which other things come. And that is the truth that the only thing that you and I really know about God comes because God has revealed it. If God didn't reveal it to us, we'd know nothing about him. First, he reveals himself in creation. Just the fact of his existence and his mighty power. But far more specifically then, in special revelation, he reveals himself through the word of God. 
So the Holy Spirit very carefully gave this word to men to be written down across the ages so that now it is his perfect word. We can depend upon it. And Jesus said, and I say this to you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. So let's talk about that church that Jesus started. You know, in this process, Jesus gave Simon a new name. But do you know, we don't quite read it right in the English. The English translation just doesn't capture this completely. Because here's what Jesus said. He said, Simon, you will now be called Petros. Petros which means a stone. It means a a rock. Think about a piece of gravel. That's what Petros meant. (laughs) I think that'd be good if the translator had translated his name as gravel. You know, Simon Gravel. That's really what 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 it was. He said, you're the little rock. You're the stone. And upon this Petra, new word. Same root, but new word doesn't mean a little stone. It means the bedrock. It means a great, great big rock, a mountain rock. Think the the rock of Gibraltar. That's what Petra means. Jesus said, upon this bedrock, I will build my church. So what is the bedrock? Upon what is the church built? Well, the Catholic Church tells us that Peter is the rock upon whom the church is founded. Others have said, oh, no, no, it's not, not Peter, but it's Peter's faith. It's the fact that, that Peter had the faith to believe God's revelation, that Jesus was the Messiah, the Son of the living God, and the church is built on faith. But how can we know? You know, how, how can we settle the dispute or how can we find a, another meaning and know for sure what is the bedrock upon which the church is built? Folks, we can know the one way you can always get an answer in Scripture. By comparing Scripture with Scripture. Not by coming to ask the pastor. <laughs> Although I don't mind if you come and ask. But I won't know unless I've compared Scripture with Scripture. And you can do that yourself. And, and so we, we look in the scripture, whenever there is a question in a text and the answer is not in that text, it's not right in that passage, many, many times, almost all the time, the answer to our question is somewhere else in scripture where scripture explains scripture. Now, wouldn't it be neat If we could find a scripture that tells us specifically what the bedrock is, what if Peter, Peter was the author of some scripture. I mean, what if Peter gave us the answer? I mean, Peter was there. Jesus was talking to Peter. Surely Peter understood what Jesus was talking about when he said, upon this bedrock, I will build my church. What if Peter tells us? And he does. In the first letter of Peter, 1 Peter chapter 2, beginning in verse 4, he says this. Coming to him as to a living stone, rejected indeed by men, but chosen by God and precious, you also, as living stones, are being built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood, to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Therefore, it is also contained in Scripture. Here it is. Behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, a great big rock, a huge piece of rock that can't be moved, upon which the whole house, the whole building can be built. I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect, 
precious. And he who believes on him will by no means be put to shame. The bedrock upon whom the church is built is not little old Peter. The bedrock upon which the church is built is not even Peter's faith nor ours. It is the Lord Jesus Christ himself. That's what Peter is saying. The bedrock upon which the church is built is the cornerstone, the Lord Jesus. When Jesus said, upon this rock I will build my church, he was pointing to himself. Your name will be the little rock. But upon this bedrock, I will build my church and therefore the very gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Folks, this is no trivial matter. You know, the whole doctrine of Petrine succession, of the succession of the, of the popes, you know, rises or falls with the understanding of this passage of Scripture. Other questions of ecclesiology, which simply means the matters of the church, the things about the church, have great implications from understanding what or who the foundation of the church really is. Ties in so well with what what the Spirit taught us through Paul about how Jesus Christ is the head of the church. Head of the church is not the pastor. I'm not the head of the church. I'm not the boss of the church. The head of the church is the Lord Jesus Christ. We seek his will. We seek his direction. We walk in his way. He is the cornerstone, the bedrock, the foundation of the church and the head of the church. Peter himself clearly says, the rock upon which the church is founded is Jesus Christ our Lord. Now the foundation rock is what guarantees the success of the church. It is because the church is founded upon Jesus Christ that the church will not perish It will not vanish out of this world until we're all raptured and caught up to meet the Lord in the air and then it'll be gone. But I mean, the world's not going to kill it. It may go underground as it did in, in China for many, many, many years. But it will never vanish because Jesus will cause it to prevail. He is the foundation stone. I got to thinking this this last week and thinking about that truth. I thought... I wonder how many believers are in church every Sunday. I started to say Sunday morning, but not all believers worship on Sunday morning. In in Brazil, the the primary worship time is Sunday evening. And and, and in other other places, not always Sunday morning, you know. But but I got to thinking, how how many believers in the world on on a given Sunday are usually gathered together for worship. And I looked to a number of sources, couldn't really find a number that seemed to be real dependable for the whole world. So I looked in the United States. There was a lot more information there. And from a source, which by the way was not a Christian source, in fact, it was more anti-Christian than it was even neutral. But, But it was a source that reports a lot of statistics. From that, I found that On most Sundays, there's about 65 million Americans in church. 65 million. And you say, well, gee, that's that's about 20% of the of the population. But I'll tell you what, do you realize how many more that is than all the people that gathered for football games this whole weekend? I mean, I'm counting the high school football games in every little city across the country and all the all the college games. By the way, did you all go to the LSU Florida game or uh, never mind? Uh, But all the college games, 
you know, all the pro games on, on Sunday, you know, you count all of those, those are a drop in the bucket compared to the number of people that are in houses of worship this day in the United States of America when, when they talk about all the problems of the church. And that's not to say we don't have a lot of problems. We're facing a lot of issues. And the, and the church in many places is struggling. But what I'm telling you is the bedrock of the church, the foundation of the church, is the Lord Jesus Christ himself. He will not fall. He will not fail. And he will cause his church to prevail. And we can count upon it, no matter what it is that happens in this world. And then there's consequences to that. Jesus said in verse 19, And I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Folks, he's talking to believers here. If you're a believer, if you've trusted the Lord Jesus Christ, you're following him. Jesus says, I will give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven. So that whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Don't raise your hands because I don't want to create too much wind here. But how many of you ever wondered what that means? I mean, what power do you really have? That whatever you bind on earth can be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth can be loosed in heaven. Let me unlock this out of the text for you. I'm going to tell you what it means and I'm going to illustrate it so you can see how we get there. The keys to the kingdom of heaven is the gospel. The gospel is the keys to the kingdom of heaven. Now, How do we know that? A lot of ways, but let me show you just a few. First of all, what did Jesus himself preach? Well, Mark tells us in Mark chapter 1, here's what Jesus preached. The time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe the gospel. What did Peter preach? He was one of those that was given the keys to the kingdom. In Acts 15, 7. And when there had been much dispute, Peter rose up and said to them, Men and brethren, you know that a good while ago God chose among us that by my mouth, Peter's mouth, the Gentile should hear the word of the gospel and believe. What did Paul preach? Romans chapter 1, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes. Folks, the keys to the kingdom is the gospel. So what is the gospel? Do you know the gospel can be expressed in three ways? sentences. Now I've taught you this before, but some folks are new. Maybe some folks forgot. All of us ought to be able to explain the gospel with these three sentences. We should know this. This should be something that that we can say on the spur of the moment to anyone when we have opportunity. Here they are. Jesus Christ, God's Son, Died on the cross for our sins. One sentence. Second sentence. Jesus rose from the dead. Third sentence. Jesus offers forgiveness of sin and the gift of eternal life to everyone who will trust him as Lord and Master. Now you know those things. But those are the three sentences. That is the gospel. That's the content of the gospel. And when we say those things, 
whether we say them that briefly or we say them with some additional explanation, but we, we say that content, we have spoken the gospel. We have shared the gospel. And Jesus said, the keys of the kingdom is the gospel. And you may be wondering, now, now Brother Mike, you, you keep messing up the English because you keep saying the keys is the gospel. And I know that's not real good English. So let me raise the primary question. Why did Jesus use the plural? Why did he say the keys to the kingdom and not just the key to the kingdom? Because everyone who gets saved gets a key. Everyone who gets saved gets a key to the kingdom of heaven. You invited Christ to become the Lord and master of your life. So by his grace, you've been saved, given eternal life. All your sins are forgiven in him. You've been given a key to the kingdom. (laughs) But you didn't get it till after you were saved or at the moment you were saved. You didn't get it so you can get in. The gospel got you in. So why do you have a key? So you can unlock heaven's door for somebody else. You're already in. You believe the gospel. You trusted Christ. You're already in. You're given the key to the kingdom. Not for yourself. For somebody else. So you can share the gospel with them. So you can tell them, listen, Jesus Christ, God's son, died on the cross for all of our sin. But he didn't stay in that tomb on the third day. He proved he was God in the flesh and he rose from the dead. And now he offers to forgive the sin of anyone who will trust in him as Lord and master and give them the gift of eternal life, a gift they could never earn, they could never work for if they worked for all eternity. He gives it to them as a gift when they trust him as Lord and Savior. And you can have that forgiveness. You can have that gift if you will trust him and You can go to heaven when you die and live with him forever and forever. That's why he gives us the keys to the kingdoms. Understanding that the gospel is the key to the kingdom helps make the next part that Jesus said make sense to us. Verse 20. It says, then he commanded his disciples that they should tell no one that he was Jesus the Christ. Haven't you ever wondered why Jesus did that? I mean, he came to seek and to save those who are lost. At times, Jesus himself declared that he was the Messiah. He was the the Christ, although it was only a few times. But he did openly acknowledge it at certain times. Why did he tell the disciples, now, I've given you the keys to the kingdom, which is the gospel, but now you don't tell anyone that I am the Christ. Have you never asked asked that question? Has that never occurred to you? Maybe somebody, oh, we don't have a choir. Choir can't answer. I just got to look to you. Have you ever wondered? Does anybody wonder? Should I just skip this part of my sermon? Does anybody wonder? Is there anybody that wants to know? Okay, all right. There's a, there's a few. The rest of you just have to endure this. But you need to know even if you don't want to know. <laughs> the reason is because there was no gospel yet. When Jesus told them this, obviously it was before he went to the cross and paid the penalty for sin. What's the first part of the gospel? Jesus died for our sins on the cross. That wasn't reality yet. There was the promise of the gospel, even in the Old Testament, even in the book of Isaiah, but not the gospel. He had not yet paid the penalty for sin, therefore he had not yet risen from the dead. 
So he said, don't yet tell them that I am the, the Christ. Not quite ready. That time is coming, but not yet. Because you see, all the Old Testament believers, those that believed the promise that God made to them during Old Testament times, they were saved because they believed what God was going to do through Christ, through the Messiah. And believing God, God, like for Abraham, accounted it to them for righteousness, so they were saved. But when they died, they did not go to heaven. They went to Sheol. Everybody that died in Old Testament times before the cross went to Sheol, the place, the abode of the dead. Now, the part of Sheol that these believers went to was called paradise. In Luke 16, Jesus talks about Abraham being in paradise. Now, you say, man, I don't understand all this stuff about Sheol and and paradise. Then you need to go to our website. And it so happens that last Wednesday night, I taught about Sheol and paradise and Abraham being there. And Luke 16, where Jesus explains all of that. And you can just stream it. And so you can learn about Sheol and paradise. And why the Old Testament believers had to, had to wait. But they had to wait in paradise, which was a place of comfort and of waiting. Separate from hell. They weren't in hell. They were in paradise. Remember how Jesus said to the thief on the cross that believed, Today you shall be with me in, hello, where? Paradise. And both Jesus and the thief went to paradise. Peter talks about that. Went to paradise. Until Jesus rose from the dead. And then he took all of those believers out of paradise with him. And he took them to the third heaven. Paradise was moved to the third heaven. So now for us today, we don't have to make that other stop. (laughs) Today, when a believer dies, he goes immediately to be with the Lord. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord for us today. But not then. And that's why Jesus didn't have them yet explaining this. Because he had not yet done the gospel. Folks, listen. If Christ had not died, there would be no way to heaven. Nobody would go to heaven. If Christ had not paid that penalty. And so in Matthew 16, 21, it says, From that time Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem, suffer many things from the elders and chief priests, and be killed and be raised the third day. He said, I've given you the keys of the kingdom. And that's the gospel. It's going to unlock heaven's doors for anyone who will trust in me. You're not ready to tell them yet, but right now, I'm headed to Jerusalem. I'm going to allow them to kill me. I'm going to rise from the dead. And then, I'll give forgiveness and eternal life to anyone who will trust in me and begin to follow me. You have the key. To the kingdom. One last part Jesus said. If anyone desires to come after me. Let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what profit is it that a, to a man if he gains the whole world. And loses his own soul or what will a man give in exchange for his soul folks cross bearing taking up our cross and following Christ means doing what Christ told us to do what are the essential things he told us to do declare the gospel make disciples made both of those things clear right before he rose back into heaven He said, as you go, make disciples in every nation. He said, 
Go, you are witnesses to me. Tell people about me in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Declaring the gospel, making disciples. But the key ingredient of cross-bearing is self-denial. Because we will never focus on doing those things as long as we are focused on doing just what we want to do. As long as the most important goal for me on a day is to do what makes me comfortable and what makes me happy and what brings me pleasure, then I will never be focused on sharing the gospel and making disciples. Cross-bearing is daily. It's not just a a one-time thing. Oh, well, I got to share the gospel with, with somebody about three years ago. I went on that mission trip, you know, a year and a half ago, and, and I, I shared the gospel with people for a whole, whole week. Dozens of people. cross daily. It's not a once-in-a-lifetime event. It's not a, well, this story makes my, my testimony, and that, that's it. The question I need to ask, you need to ask, is what have I done in bearing my cross with the Lord today? <laughs> today. What have I done today? Folks, just getting out of bed on Sunday morning and making it to church is not (laughs) cross-bearing. Cross-bearing, sharing the gospel, making disciples, following the will of the Father rather than the will of ourselves. And we're to do that daily. The key to cross-bearing is making our life count for eternity. So that the things that we do have value in eternity and not just personal, comforting kind of value to ourselves or even just a small group around us for a day or two. Stand with me, let's pray. Jesus said, What will a person give? In exchange for his soul. The soul is our mind, it's our will, our emotions. You could say the soul is really the whole of the self. It's what we are. Said what Jesus said, what do you give in exchange for that? And the way for your soul to be fulfilled is by following me, by surrendering, by bearing your cross daily. Folks, those who have not trusted Christ have a decision to make today. The gospel has been made clear to you today, just three sentences. But in those few words are the truth that changes eternity. I'm telling you, it will unlock the doors of heaven for you if you will believe it and put your trust in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. But for those of us who have done that and who have been saved and will spend eternity with our Lord, the question is, will our life count? You know, will will our mind and our will and emotions, will that that all summed up that identifies, hey, that's me, that's Mike. Will that have counted for these years that I've spent upon the earth? Will it have any value for eternity? Every one of us who are a believer will one day stand before the judgment seat of Christ, not to determine our salvation, but to determine God's judgment, Jesus' judgment upon what we've done with our lives since we were saved. And that's what Jesus was challenging his disciples to consider. What will a man give in exchange for his soul? Does yours count? Bow with me, let's pray. If you're a fellow believer then would you just ask the Lord to make your understanding now that the gospel is the key to the kingdom, that you have been given so you can unlock it for someone else.
and that you want your life to count for eternity and not just be spent in pursuing your own pleasures and comforts? Would you say to Jesus, Jesus, increasingly I want to take up my cross daily and follow you. I want to regularly share the gospel. I want to be making disciples. And I want to spend the days of my life doing these things, following you. For those who have not yet trusted Christ, but the Spirit of God is saying to your heart right now, the gospel you have heard is true. And Jesus will forgive all those sins in your life. If you'll just trust him, make him Lord. If you'll just trust him as your own Lord and Savior, he will give to you the gift of eternal life and you can live with him forever. And as the Spirit bears witness to that in your heart, would you respond? by repenting of your sin, believing the gospel, putting your trust in Christ. If you want to do that, you can just pray right where you're at, just in the quiet of your heart, this prayer with me. Dear Jesus, I know I'm a sinner in desperate need of a Savior. And Jesus, I believe you are God's own Son. And I believe you died on the cross for my sin. And Jesus, I believe you rose from the dead. Today I repent of my sin. Jesus, I invite you to come into my life. To become the Lord, the master of my life. I want you to become my king. So I will obey you. And I will follow you the rest of my days. In Jesus' name, amen. If you just prayed that prayer, trust in Christ, I ask you as soon as we're dismissed to go over to our next steps desk. One of our pastors will be there. Just You can just say simply, I prayed that prayer with Brother Mike. Give him just a few minutes to help you know how to begin this new walk with Christ. It'll help you so much if you'll just do that. Let's worship the Lord. Come, my fount of every blessing, tune my heart to sing thy praise. Streams of mercy never ceasing, Call for songs of loudest praise. Teach me some melodious sonnet, sung my flaming tongues above. Praise the mountain fixed upon it, mount of thy redeeming love. Seal it for
Amen, church. Remain standing just for a moment. One quick announcement. We are so excited to be hosting our night of worship tonight, 5 o'clock right here off of Bayview outside. Cannot wait to fill our neighborhood with praise music. It's going to be really good. I'm really excited about it. Uh, food trucks will be available at 5 o'clock for purchasing food, and then worship will start around 6.15 right after sunset. We're so excited. We actually will have a, a child care for babies up to preschool as well. Come be a part of this tonight. It's going to be really, really exciting uh, at 5 o'clock. Let's pray together, and we'll be dismissed. God, we love you. Thank you so much for the opportunity that we have here to worship together. Lord, we are so grateful that we have your word. Lord, I pray, Lord, as we leave this place, may, may it fill our hearts, the words that we've heard, the, the songs that we sung, may it fill our hearts today and through the rest of the week. May we take the opportunities that you give us to share your love and grace with others as we come in contact with them. We love you. In Christ, we pray. Amen. You're dismissed.